Okay, so um, it's important for us to be able to. Um, <laughs> sorry, uh, sorry. <laughs> I, I saw relative dating, and you know, I had. To, um, uh, it you know, as history is a, an historical science, and you know, reconstructing what has happened in the past since that is important for us to understand the landforms, the materials, uh, you know, the, the landscapes we see today, clearly it's important for us to be able to put dates on things that have happened in the past. And we'll cover, we'll cover one side of that coin today, and we'll cover the other side of it and the geological time scale on Tuesday. And the first is this idea of relative dating. So, as I've just kind of already alluded to, um, we need to be able to infer past events, and we need to know what happened when, and when that was, uh, and what sequence. And so, telling time is essentially very important. We have two kinds of age dating. Relative dating that we'll talk about today is essentially just what happened before what else? What was the sequence? What happened first? What happened second? What happened third? So um, we'll get to that in a minute. That's maybe half the story, but we can be much more specific and nuanced in the stories we can we tell about how the world developed if we can put absolute ages on events. So Hutton knew that the landscapes he was looking at were old. But there's no way he could tell how old old was. It's clearly more than 4,000 years, but, you know, would it take... A million years, 10 million years, 100 million years, 10 trillion years? I mean, you just don't know. I mean, if you think back to uh, Sicker Point there, clearly the gray walkie, uh, those vertical sediments must have been um, earlier in the sequence than the later, you know, reddish sandstones that were laid down on top. Okay. So this is the Grand Canyon. Um, this is taken from the Bright Angel Trail on the south rim, looking up the um, Bright Angel Fault going up into the north rim. And what do you see? Layers. Layers. Okay. So there's uh, this kind of lightish layer here. And um, there's kind of a vertical layer here. And then there's kind of more slopey layers here. And then there's maybe these kinds of more vertical layers here. And then there's this kind of greenish slopey layer. And then we've got this steeper part of the canyon. Got all these layers. Um, what's your interpretation of those layers? Okay, which of these layers would be, have been laid down first? The lowest ones. Okay, so it's those kinds of principles that we'll talk about in, in terms of doing relative age dating. And there are you know, six of those principles we'll go through and talk about you know, how we can in, use them to interpret the landscape. Then we'll spend some time um, just as a group um, trying to reconstruct uh, some different situations. I've got some uh, worksheets to hand out. We'll either do the, have time to do them in class today or, or you can bring them to the lab on Tuesday. Okay. So, um,
There are these six principles of relative dating. Some of these are clearly more important than others. Um, I've got them all listed here. Superposition, original horizontality, lateral continuity, cross-cutting relationships, inclusions, final succession. Um, if you think about it, we can today, if we have a road cut or if we're doing seismic um, probing of the, the strata underneath the ground, we can come up with a kind of a profile of what layers are present in an area and what their relationship is. Essentially, in terms of relative dating, what you're trying to do is to take these principles and reconstruct the history of what layers were created first, what happened to them, how did they get tilted, how did they get deformed, um, what cut through them, and you put that all together. We won't take the time to go through this diagram. You can take a look at it more from the, um, the video later. But uh, you, know, you can build up a story where you've first got layers and then they get crumpled and then erosion planes off the top and then we get more layers laid down and oh by the way in, in the meantime there was this intrusion of magma that happened and then the whole thing flips over and then it gets planed off again and then there are new layers that are laid out on top if you put that all together you can come up with this and so this sequence could be a reconstruction to explain what we've got here so it's kind of a uh, kind of a puzzle um, and you know just by looking at the relationship of different layers and strata today we can reconstruct what happened when. Now do we know how many hundred million years ago this lava came in? No. But we know it happened you know before these layers but after these layers. That's what relative dating is all about. Okay, so the principle of superposition is probably the easiest one. Things get laid down on the top, generally speaking. So if you've got a landscape and you've got some process... Okay, so I guess we start up where we left off. Okay, so principle of superposition... Um, uh, let me just run through this since we got hijacked some of our time. Clearly, if you've got a landscape and you've got some process that is going to deposit new sediments, new layers, they're going to be deposited on the top of what's there, and each succeeding layer will be deposited up and up and up and up the 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 strata. I mean, we clearly see that. Um, with the Grand Canyon, uh, and we'll probably have opportunities to talk about the Grand Canyon more later, but uh, we, we, if we ignore the lowest levels of the Grand Canyon, which are really ancient rock, we essentially have like 200 million old, year old, well, we're we're talking relative dating. So we basically have all these different sedimentary layers. So we've got shale that was laid down and then limestone and then different kinds of limestone and um, a, a mix of things here. And we get up to the Coconino sandstone and the Kaibab limestone at the top. We have essentially this layer cake that uh, clearly got laid down at, at some point. And then, how did all these layers get exposed? Well, we know that there's Colorado River flowing down the middle, down the bottom of the Grand Canyon, and uh, you know it has carved its way down, and then erosion is going to um, eat those sides back further and further and further. But superposition, basically, unless something has happened to screw things up. Younger, higher is younger, deeper is older. Now, original horizontality seems like we're talking about the same thing, but um, it's a little bit different. 
The idea here is that we assume that layers, generally speaking, are laid down in a horizontal fashion. That's pretty much a somewhat a restatement of what we just talked about. But what we see is that layers don't always stay horizontal. They get tilted, they get warped, they get bent, they get deformed in different ways. And um, all of that folding and tilting and faulting that happens later, happens later. Okay? Um, so if you see something that is not, if you see layers that are no longer horizontal or something is, has happened to screw up those, the horizontality of those layers, those processes that cause that happened after the processes that created the layers to begin with. So, I mean, that's the, that's the important point. So again, going back to Hutton and what he was looking at with uh, those um, Greywacke and red sandstone uh, deposits at Sicker Point. Basically, they're not horizontal anymore, so he, the assumption is they were laid down horizontally and something that happened later to upend them. Uh, lateral continuity, again, seems kind of similar, but uh, it's essentially you can match up layers that are separated and infer that in the past they used to be continuous layers and something has happened to cause a break. Some erosion, generally speaking, some faulting, something. Um, you know, it's, it's easiest to see probably if you're talking about this layer cake approach here and some river has cut down through the middle and clearly this limestone here got to be the same as this limestone over here. I mean, it just makes sense. But sometimes it can be a little bit more complicated than that. So if you've got uh, layers and they are deformed, in, uh, in, you know, in, in a way that you know, the middle is bulged up, erosion processes can you know, er, uh, get rid of, of those intervening layers. And what you see are these tilted layers on this side and these tilted layers on this side, but by correlating the sequence of layers we see here and the tilt and the sequence of layers that we see here in the tilt, we can infer, we can reconstruct that Oh, it used to be flat. It got pushed up in the middle and shaved off. So going back to that Coconino sandstone as an example, if you look at it in the Grand Canyon, it is this pronounced light layer that is toward the top. Uh, it's a couple layers down from the Kaibab limestone that caps off the top. And, and that's the top of the sequence of the Grand Canyon. But these layers, when they were laid down, extended for hundreds of kilometers. And so if you go down to Sedona, you can again see this Coconino sandstone. Um, and um, a different arrangement of layers for reasons, I mean, some of the... Some layers will extend further horizontally than others, and so you get some layers dropping out of these sequences and, and others rem remaining. If you look here, the, here's a more close-up view of the same Coconino sandstone um, layer in uh, Walnut Canyon, which is not, um, not all that far away from the, from the Grand Canyon. And so... Um, it's a little clearer in the Walnut Canyon area that above and below the Coconino Sandstone, we see the same kind of layers that we see in the Grand Canyon. So it's clear that we can correlate, well, this sandstone we see here, it was essentially laid down at the same time as that sandstone in a huge, um, you know, and since it's sandstone, we're talking about basically huge, dry desert sand dunes stretching for hundreds of kilometers back at the time when these were laid down, whenever that was, but we don't know it yet because we haven't done the absolute age dating. And what is the Coconino? Who names it that? Coconino? Uh, well, the, um, 
the formations are oftentimes identified by the location where they're first identified. You know, especially if you have tilted layers coming up and, and being exposed at the surface, you know, you might have the um, Birmingham shale because the geologist back in 18 whatever who was categorizing the, uh, you know, the area uh, was in Birmingham and saw this shale deposit exposed at the surface. So oftentimes the, the, the names of the, of the layers are place names. Yeah. Um, Coconino is a, um, yeah, I think that's the, uh, the county that Flagstaff is in. So uh, Coconino County. And it's, you know, um, the name itself is presumably derived from Either Spanish or or some corruption, some Spanish corruption of uh, indigenous names for the area. Um, principle of cross cutting is now uh, a little bit different, and uh, I think this is is one that you will um, use a lot in trying to reconstruct what's going on here. It's essentially saying that you can have all these layers of stuff and then at a later time something can come through and interrupt those layers. So we could have some um, magma that's rising up through the earth and cutting its way through the existing layers and forming uh, what's known as a, a dike. As, or, or a sill, depending on whether it's vertical or horizontal. Um, and so for this, let's say this granitic material that's coming up through here, to have cut through these layers, which, which has to have had, which has to have been there first? Are these, which is older, the, the, the dike here or these layers that the dike is going through? Layers. Layers over there, the dike cuts through it. Okay? If the layers weren't there, clearly the, the lava that's coming up would just flop all over the place. It would not you know, cut through that way. Uh, when you said silt, is that the same as a crouton? No. Um, silt. When we're talking about a dike or silt, we're talking about an intrusion of magma, magmatic material that is kind of narrow and it's working its way up through fractures. Uh, Pluton is it's a more massive kind of thing. Can we only see this with magma? Um, yeah, in turn, well, in terms of dikes and sills, yeah, you have to have molten rock for it to flow up through the through the cracks. But you can also have cross cutting relationships that are due to faults, which is the case here. That's what I was going to ask. Yeah. yeah. Is there a difference? Yeah, well, the fault or the dike can produce cross-cutting relationships, okay. and you use those cross-cutting relationships to know what happened when. So let's say we've got um, this B layer here is limestone, and the A layer here is sandstone, um, and then we've got this uh, dike of... Um, uh, granitic material and then there is a maybe a shaley layer that was down below here. How would you interpret this diagram? Which, which happened first? The layers or the dike? Layers. layers. The layers or the fault? Layers. The fault or the dike? Layers. Right. Because the fault cuts the dike in two. So essentially what happened, if you wanted to reconstruct this, you'd have the sandstone, the limestone, and the shale, and then this dike comes up through, and then a later time, uh, this fault happens, and the, the right side, is the right side um, slipping down or pushing up? Yeah. Slipping down. So the right side slips down, and then eventually erosion uh, wears off the, the, the surface so you get a, a thinner layer of sandstone over here than you have over here. Okay. 
So we're basically talking about superposition, original horizontality, and cross-cutting relationships you know, allow us to piece back uh, together what happened here and in what order. Now, we don't know when, but we know when-ish. Okay. So, I mean, here's an example of a fault that clearly happened after these different layers of rock were laid down. Um, here's an example of uh, uh, a dike and this might actually be a, a sill, but here we have clearly all of these sedimentary layers that were there previously, and then up through some fracture in, the, in, uh, in those layers, we get this intrusion of magma, and it cuts across those layers. So clearly it happened later. Is that in the uh, No, I'm not sure where I pulled these from actually. I pulled them from Google. Okay. Inclusions is a little bit uh, um, more compl complex, maybe. But basically, uh, when rocks are being produced, once they have been produced, it's difficult for other rocks to get inside, you know, beyond the kind of magmatic intrusion for dikes and sills. So in this case over here, we have little chunks of the granite that were incorporated into the sandstone. So which of these layers had to have been present first? The granite. Okay. On the other hand, we've, here we've got little chunks of sandstone that are showing up in the granite. So which would have had, had to have been there first? Sandstone. So that's kind of weird. Uh, we're talking about the granite, which is the lower layer, being younger than the sandstone. But, you know, granite is magmatic rock, so you could have had the layers here and then the granite came up, the, the magma that pr eventually produced the granite came up as a big blob of molten material and uh, got that far and no further. But as it was doing that, some fragments of the sandstone fell into the magma before it solidified. And so in this case, we've got an example. We've got evidence for this lower layer having actually been intruded and being, produced, being put in place underneath the layers above. Is that the only case that can actually cause that? Yeah. Um, you're not going to get sedimentary rock forcing their way up <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, here's an example uh, from our trip uh, out this last spring this is in Sunset Crater Volcano National Monument so we've got a big basaltic lava field that we were in and this is clearly not basalt this is you know, some pre-existing rock that the basalt picked up as it was going through uh, here, here we have a, an example of a basalt inclusion that is in the midst of all this granite. And so uh, this is a situation, again, where the basalt was there in place first, the granite intruded and displaced you know, some of the basalt, maybe melted others, and accumulated fragments from the pre-existing basalt. Um, so essentially, the rock that's included in the other rock had to have been older. It had to have been around for it to be incorporated into the matrix of the newer, younger rock. Uh, and then last is this idea of faunal succession, which we won't address a lot in, in this course, but a lot of the um, a lot of the early development of the correlation of strata, you know, uh, recognizing that this is uh, Cambrian layer strata, and this is uh, Devonian, and this is Carboniferous, and this is Pennsylvanian. A lot of that was tied to the fact that we see different kinds of organisms living at different times in the past. And if you've got something like a trilobite, in your geological strata, and we know that trilobites died out hundreds of millions of years ago, that 
um, you know, a, a, an upper layer here that's got some kind of bony fish fossil in it had to have been younger than the, uh, than the layer that's got the trilobite. And if we can match up this uh, brachiopod species that we know is only present in the fossil record for a short period of time, and we see that same brachiopod species over here, we, th we have a pretty good idea that these layers had to have been laid down somewhat at the same time, even though you know, this is limestone and this is sandstone. Um, different environmental conditions, but the indicator species allows us to tie both of those in the different geographic areas to the same time band. How does a layer disappear? Like, how does a layer? Um, let's say that this was uh, a shale, which would be kind of mud laid down in a near uh, shore environment that then gets compressed and compacted into the shale. Well, if uh, the sea recedes, you're not going to be producing shale anymore. So just the and you know that Coconino sandstone layer was very extensive geographically because at the time we had whole areas of what at that time, what is now the, the desert southwest was desert even though it wasn't in the same place then as it was now because of continental drift and all that stuff. But uh, you know we had huge expanses of desert, lots of sandy areas and you know, a very geographically extensive sandstone layer that shows up in the Grand Canyon and in, in Sedona and Walnut Canyon and on all sorts of other places. You know, other depositional environments might be much smaller. Like you might have just a small basin, um, you know, largish lake kind of thing. You're not going to get uh, layers that go for kilometers and kilometers. Okay, so um, the other thing we need to, to keep in mind are these uh, opportunities for gaps to show up in the, in the rock record. And I think for our purposes and, and for your uh, looking at this, these uh, angular nonconformities are probably the most obvious. So here... Um, here we've got these layers here that are at this angle, and then there is this angular nonconformity, and then we've got other layers that are laid down horizontally here. So how would you interpret that? Uh, the bottom layers were tilted and then eroded, and then top layers were deposited after. Right. Okay, so the bottom layers were laid down horizontally, original horizontality, uh, principle of superposition. So, you know, unless it was really, really tilted, it was only tilted a little bit, you know, these would be the older layers, these would be the younger layers, and then that got tilted, and then erosion shaved that off, and then we have a new flat surface for laying down new layers. So, during the shaving, we're losing rock record, right? So an angular unconformity basically shows us where um, the, the rock record is discontinuous. There, there's a gap. We see this in the Grand Canyon. If we look at some of the you know, uh, uh, older basement layers, some of the Vishnu schist and, and other things. They were laid down um, a billion plus years ago and then at some point tilted and at some point shaved off and then the sedimentary layers aren't starting to be laid down until 450, 500 million years ago. So there's a gap of like a half a billion years a record that's just gone, it's not there. These other two are, are a little bit more difficult uh, to recognize. Uh, 
We have nonconformity, which is where you've got a, an eroded plutonic surface, that is, igneous rock, that then, I mean, the fact that this is eroded, and it, 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 during that time when erosion is taking place, you're not building up the record. You're losing, you're not recording what the environmental conditions were, except that they were environmental conditions that led to erosion and not the production of rock. And then later, when you do get, say, a, an inland sea coming in here and depositing sedimentary layers on top of that um, base of, of eroded igneous rock, that's known as a nonconformity, and it basically, again, represents a break in the record. We don't know. It could be you know, a million years, 10 million years, half a billion years, but some part of the record's gone. And disconformity as opposed to nonconformity, uh, in this case, it's a gap between two parallel sedimentary layers. And this is, uh, I mean, I probably would have difficulty picking this kind of stuff out in the field. So here we've got these layers of sedimentary rock that are laid down. And then we've got this line here. And then we've got more layers. And if you're a really hardcore geologist, you can tell that, well, this, this gap here is different. This represents a time when there weren't any sediments being laid down. But, you know, that's pretty subtle. Okay, so we have a couple more minutes. Um, what's, what's going on here? We have, we have uh, dike and sill formation that we have to be concerned with. We have a fault. We've got uh, you know, a layer of limestone here and a layer of shale. And we've got some igneous layer, so maybe granite or something. We've got some sandstone. We've got some more shale. Um, which is older, the dike or the fault? Fault is older. Okay, so that means this dike is probably one of the latest things to happen. So in terms of a sequence, you know, we'd put H here at the top. Um, Well, I'm assuming that R was in place okay. when this came up, which forced it into this dike kind of situation. It could be, could be that the, the, the dike actually broke the surface and you've got kind of a basaltic uh, lava flow here that was later had um, shale laid on top of it. So, you know, we don't know. But... And it's a pretty rough diagram, but I'm, I'm interpreting that as kind of a dike that came in between these two layers. Uh, and in terms of the layers, the lower layers, I mean, clearly, by, by what principle do we say that I is older than B? No, let's just look at this part here. Superposition. Superposition tells us I is oldest, B is next oldest, F, and then M. Okay? So we essentially had this layer cake laid down. We have a fault that happens. And um, then, yeah, this layer gets eroded off so it's smoothed off. This layer comes down on top. And then the last thing to happen is the dike that comes in here. What about, uh, what about over here? Yeah, so, I mean, we've got some layers. We maybe have an unconformity here. We've got a fault, uh, and those layers got tilted, and then they got planed off, and then we have layers being laid down in this direction, and then they got tilted a little bit more, and then they got planed off, and then there's this one on top, and then part of it's been eroded out, and then we've also got at some point this has come up. Yeah, this would be a kind of a magnetic intrusion. This would have been hot bubbling stuff coming up from underneath, 
and eating away. Yeah, yeah. So it's complicated, but if you, you know, you've got superposition going on here, you've got cross cutting relationships, you've got um, angular uh, uh, unconformities, you've got maybe um, uh, non conformities, you've got you, you, you might have intrusions, little bits of, of limestone and shale that are in the granite, uh, rep, you know, uh, from the granite having bubbled up through. Putting those all together, you can build up a story of what has happened in this area. Uh, just bear with me for just a minute. Same kind of thing. I mean, clearly we've got what, what, what's telling us the age of these layers here, the relative age. Why is A older than B, older than C? Superposition. Superposition. What is this? Oh. Fault. And then we know the fault is older than these layers because of cross-cutting relationships. Same thing here. Here we, we have much clearer, this is clearly a dike, and, and I mean a sill. And we've got these dike. We've got this magma chamber and the dikes, uh, the sills going out here, and then the volcanic eruption. Now, um, this dike here versus this sill here, which is older? I'm comparing this sill and this dike, which you can't see anymore because I've scribbled all over them, but. The, the dike is pushing back, is pushing up through the sill. So obviously this, this bit of magma activity happened first, and this pluton later came up and worked its way through. Um, except, looks like this has all been shaved off by erosion, and this is cutting through the, so, you know, complicated relationships, you have to draw on all of these principles to try to reconstruct them. Uh, I'll give you I'll give you this at some point to um, to work through.